It was racing to survive. It wasn't racing to perform. What do I need to do to get an opportunity with an F1 team? At the end of that season, I got Toto's email and emailed him. Did you? And he made it clear, go and perform and you'll be in the car. This week on High Performance, Mercedes Formula One race winner. George Russell. Thrown into that car and I qualified second, 20 milliseconds behind my teammate and I was disappointed. That speed and thrill I got from experiencing that Formula One car, I had added motivation and fire within my stomach. That was just such an awesome experience. Every single opportunity you've got, you've got to make the most of it. Lewis is an incredibly unique character. You mean he doesn't fit in the traditional mold? He's incredibly inspiring. What did you think when you realised who it was that you'd had a come in together with? It was quite a scary moment. I'd never crashed at that speed before doing 330 kilometers an hour. DRS open, got on a wet patch, the car just spun. I'm going sideways down the track, carbon fiber flying everywhere. I can't see to my right because you've kind of locked in the cockpit. I don't know what I'm going to hit. I mean, Toto said to me after that crash, I am hardest on the ones I care about most. Listen, I want to say a massive thank you to all of our new subscribers, but you know, most people that watch this content on YouTube don't subscribe. I want to change that. The more subscribers, then the more amazing we can make high performance. And I've had a lovely message actually from Rob who says I only recently discovered the high performance channel and I watched the full Eddie Howe and Tyson Fury interviews both some of the best content I've seen in the last five years on YouTube listen if you agree and you want to keep this amazing stuff coming for free then hit subscribe right now thank you so much well George thank you very much for joining us thank you let's start as we always do what is your version of high performance high performance is working hard I think it's, it's as simple as that. You know, it's um, the life we live. It's all about high performance between, um, you know, the athlete, the driver in the car, the machine, the car itself, the engine, the tires, and absolutely everything. And everyone within that organization has got to be you know, performing at the top level. So um, I guess that's it. So let's talk then about where this understanding of hard work came from. So like, let's just go backwards a few years before Formula One. Your brother raced in go-karts. And is that is that sort of where the passion came from? But then the question is, where did the, the understanding of the hard work and the determination and, and all of that come from? Yeah, I think having my brother, who's 11 years older than me, going through his journey, he started karting when he was 11 or 12 years old, which in our world is probably five years too late. So he was a bit behind the curve. He was an incredibly talented uh, go-kart driver. He won British championships. He won world championships. But unfortunately for him, they were probably five years too late and he missed that opportunity to go into single-seaters and get an opportunity into, into Formula One. But seeing what he and my father went through, also probably seeing where, um, you know, he wouldn't mind me saying this, where they sort of fell short and the mistakes he probably made on his journey I was so fortunate that my family my parents and even my brother who sort of mentored me and helped me through my journey helped me to avoid some of these mistakes and um, recognize you know how hard you need to work the sacrifices you need to put in if you do want to achieve that success and what were those mistakes <laughs> I think I mean yeah, again, I don't, I don't want to talk talk anything bad about my yeah. my brother here, but I don't think he'll mind me saying that. You know, when he went to university, and you know, when you're surrounded by some people who maybe aren't the best influence, drinking, partying, probably doing things that a top athlete shouldn't be. Yeah, but but doing, doing. things that a university student does. Yeah, That's exactly. the point. It's like there's no criticism there. No, is absolutely, there? Like absolutely. And I think this is where I probably recognised when he was. 21, 22, 23. And I was sort of on my journey, started being competitive as a 9, 10, 11 year old, seeing that, you know, it's not an easy world we live. And if you do want to reach the top, you've got to give it everything. And unfortunately, you just can't um, go down every single path. You know, you can't go out at the weekends, partying and drinking and having fun as a normal sort of teenager is doing if you want to be able to perform on the racetrack at the following weekend. Wow. So those sacrifices that you saw were being made, were you learning them at quite an easy age when it was easy to, to make those sacrifices? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, I mean, I left school when I was 14. And as I was sort of growing up 15, 16 or 17, I, I, I had a few mixed feelings 
about that. You know, I was pursuing my dream and I felt so fortunate and grateful that I was getting that opportunity to race. I felt like I was missing a bit of a social life and I saw the friends who I had at school then, you know, having what you would define as sort of fun and enjoying themselves. But I look back now and I feel like that, if I continued in my my path with the sort of friends and the group of people who I had around me, that perhaps wouldn't have been the best influence for me to achieve what I wanted to achieve. And I think one thing I, I, I've learned from all of that is the people you surround yourself are yeah. so, so, so important. Yeah. So, so tell, well, yeah, go, on. go on, tell us about that then. So what have you learned about the characters that you allow into your inner circle? I think you need to recognize if somebody's bringing positivity to you or not. And I think having achieved a bit of success, you know, reaching Formula One, you do see people who sort of come out of the woodworks and, you know, try and get a piece of that success. Or, you know, even if it's something, so, oh, can you get some tickets here or there or thinking it's so simple and you sort of think to yourself well I've not heard from you in five six seven years and yeah. you know you weren't there when I went through the struggle you're sort of there now that I'm succeeding and um and I'm always trying to be polite with everybody so I'd, I'd always try and help in a situation like that but suddenly when it goes a little bit too far and these people are sort of sucking energy away from you you almost think you don't need people like that yeah. in my life and I do think now I have such a, a close uh, amount of people around me. I don't have loads of friends. I, I've, I've already got a handful of friends who I speak to on a, on a weekly basis. I've got my girlfriend, I've got my family. And that's kind of all I need, really. It reminds me of, we interviewed um, Vicky Patterson. She was a, a, a lady that sort of made a career in reality TV. And I may she, have watched that. Right, okay, yes. <laughs> I may have watched some of that when I was a bit younger. But she spoke to us really powerfully about what you've just described and she she came up with what she calls the phone test. So how, how she responds when somebody's name cre- uh, crops up in her phone determines where they are. So some people, she said, light up your life. They were igniters. Mm-hmm. Some people were draggers. Yeah. Because all they have a phone in for is to want the tickets. Yeah, and then she described that the vast majority of people are middle of the roaders mm-hmm. where they don't offer any value, but they don't detract from it either. And that was the way that she determined it. So what is the biggest lesson that you've learned then to be able to keep people at bay that are bringing negativity or just wanting things? I think you've always got to be polite to to everybody. And I never want to be arrogant or I never like to ignore people or, or be rude. But I think, as I said, sometimes you've got to look out for yourself and recognize you, you can't please everybody. You've got to please the people around you. You've got to try and please yourself. But when you try, and I, I used to, I, I used to struggle at saying no to things. Yeah. You know, somebody would ask me to do something. Yeah, no problem. You know, can, can we, can I see you for a cup of coffee? Yeah, no problem. Can we do this? And when I look at my, my diary in a month's time, it kind of looks quite empty, but you know, one week later, two weeks later, suddenly that diary's filling up pretty damn quickly and I get to the time I think Christ I'm going for you know a quick cup of coffee with this person or I'm doing this event which isn't really adding any value to me if anything it's taken away from my performance I this is an opportunity I could have been in the gym it's an opportunity I could have been on the phone with my engineers preparing for an event and I come away from something like that just feeling a bit more downbeat a bit more tired thinking to myself you know this is not bringing anything to my life and um you have to almost be selfish in in a regard. And and do you are you the sort of person now that needs the the friends and the social stuff and the going out and <clears throat> you know, having a couple of drinks or letting your hair down or are you totally happy to be in this world of kind of single minded focus and determination in achieving your Formula One goals? Because let's be clear, if we're having this conversation in ten years, we probably introduce you as veteran Formula One driver. That's if you've managed <laughs> to get ten years in in a sport which most drivers don't, right? So you're very much in a moment, I think. Is that part of your thinking? It's, I, I, I sort of question myself as well in, in that way. I don't have the answer. I think, you know, throughout this year, I've obviously taken a big step, joining Mercedes sort of in the big leagues as such with, you know, those three top teams at the forefront of, of Formula One. 
And I just I kind of want to keep an open mind. I think so many people say, you know, you need to be so dedicated. You, you know, you, every single day needs to be the most important day of your life. You can't be out drinking, partying, whatever. But there's definitely an element of you need to be happy, you need to enjoy yourself, and you need to be in the right state of mind. And there are times when, you know, I've just come off the back of two very difficult race weekends. You know, these were two of my worst three races of this whole season. And it was Sunday night in Singapore, awful race. I was just laying in my bed. A couple of people went out for for some nice dinner. They might have had a drink or two. I wouldn't have had a, had a drink because I was racing the following week. I was just laying in my bed because I didn't have that motivation to go out. But I didn't sleep at all that night because all I could think about was that race, that disappointment and how things could have gone better. And perhaps had I gone for dinner with a couple of friends, taking my mind totally away from that disappointment, yep. I'd have got you know a good eight, nine hours sleep that night and I'd have been in better shape for the following race weekend. So in a way, by doing something that you think is, is the right thing to do, by trying to get an early night's sleep, by not going for dinner or whatever and just relaxing in a room that played against me in a way. Yeah, I can understand that. Um, and it is, you're totally right, it's about exploring. You will find over time the things that work well for you Absolutely. in the more elite environment. So let's wind the clock back and talk about how you ended up in this elite environment. Your brother is go-karting, you're going along, you start racing, you see his mistakes, you then develop this kind of single-minded focus. Can we just go through, you sort of brushed it off as not a big deal, but walking away from school at 14 is a big deal yeah. because that's kind of like a contract there with everyone in your life where you go, I'm not just going to be a normal kid. I'm going to give up education at 14 years of age. I mean, it feels to me like there's a bit of pressure automatically applied at that point because it's like, okay, you better make this work. Yeah, I guess so. I, I think I always believed that I'd make it to Formula One. I think as a, as a, as a child, you're a bit naive in that regard. When I was probably 11 years old, I believed I could achieve anything. I felt like I could fly to the moon and, and back easily. And I used to have races that I felt so superior to everyone. I would, there was, I remember this one race that I said, I'm, I'm going to overtake this person on the last lap in this corner because I felt like I could do it. And it was the most stupid thing ever, but I managed to achieve it. And at that age, I just felt like I could do anything. And that probably played against me as I grew up slightly and when I left school at 14, I had a similar view that I felt like I could achieve anything in this world. You go out, you win, and you'll be a Formula One world champion before you know it. And it was only when I was 15 or 16 that I started to recognize that life isn't as straightforward as that. You know, you may be very talented, but you need to do a hell of a lot more if you want to make it. The stars need to align, especially in a sport like ours where there's only 20 race seats available and it's not like there's 20 race seats available every year. There's only one or two race seats available every year for, for a great driver to come in, a great driver's got to leave. So yeah. I was growing up racing against thousands of different kids, all striving for that same goal. Yet every year there's only going to be one or two, if you're lucky, make it to Formula One. And I guess, yeah, when I was 16, I realized. How, how did you come to that realization then? I came to that realization that I think when I was 15, I had a bit of a tricky year in go-karting. That was probably my 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 worst year in go-karts. Is that your first year after you'd left education as well? It, yeah, it was, coincidentally. Uh, whether that had anything to, to, uh, to do with it or not, I'm not sure. I don't think it did because I think I know what, what went wrong that season. I then raced uh, my first year in single-seaters in, in Formula 4. So, you know, that's a small Formula 1 car effectively bottom of, a, of the range when you're 16 to 18 years old and I won that championship but I hadn't been picked up from a Formula 1 team and I was sort of thinking to myself you know what do I need to do to get an opportunity with an F1 team I've I won this championship I've won races I didn't dominate the championship but I won the championship and I wasn't getting that break as such and it was towards the end tail end of that year I thought this might not work and that's when at the end of that season I got Toto's email and emailed him did you mm. that's so, interesting yeah there's two there's two questions here I'm interested in is one how did you process what might have felt 
to me, if I'm imagining being in your position, a sense of mild panic at this stage that you've 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 gone all in on getting picked up and you're not getting picked up. So how did you handle that? And this email that you sent, I'm fascinated to know what did you say? Yeah, I think I thought at the age of 16, the world would come to me. And as I said, it was only during that year that I realized they're not looking for me. You've got to go and look for them. You've got to knock on their door. You know, Toto's not going to look at British Formula 4 and say, you know, there's a kid, George Russell here, who's won the championship by a couple of points. We need to sign him. But if I put myself in front of him and talk to him and show him what I'm made of, maybe there's an opportunity. So it was. I remember I was in Abu Dhabi at the time doing a, doing a test in Formula 3. I managed to get hold of his email. And I thought, I've got nothing to lose. You know, worst case, he doesn't reply, in which case I've lost nothing. Best case, he replies. And... I literally just sent him an email. I didn't want to um, go in too hard. I just said, you know, I'm George Russell. I raced this. Uh, be, it would be great to meet you and, and talk about the future potentially. And um, I think it was a good time to do it as well. I think time is key. They just won the championship. He he was standing himself on the podium after the, the Abu And was that run. luck on your part or was that a bit of foresight? No, I, I that was luck. But now I look back and I realise, you know, these small things make a difference yeah. you know you you need somebody on the receiving end to be in the right state of mind if he's having a bad day or he's busy yep. and he sees this if i sent that email one week earlier which is for tuesday before the Abu Dhabi grand prix last race of the season he probably would have seen it and disregarded it but it was the tuesday after the Abu, Abu Dhabi grand prix season's over he's relaxed won the championship you know here's an opportunity oh this you know this kid's just emailed me and i sent this email i think it was about 9 p.m. in the evening and he replied within 15 minutes with his PAs um, copied in saying hi George nice to, to hear from you and it'll be great to, to meet you in in January and uh, four weeks later I sat in his office and what was said that day to be honest not a lot was was said that day um, we I told him about my career he asked a lot of questions he was obviously very very nice and gave me a lot of time and I think something I've realized about Toto since day one, he gives everybody a huge amount of time, but it wasn't as simple as, all right, we're going to sign you today. And that's that. We left that conversation saying, right, I'm now going to race in Formula 3. This is where you're taking the next step. You know, we'll keep an eye on you and we'll stay in touch and we'll go from there. And it was only at the end of 2015 where we picked up the conversation again. And that's when I signed for, for Mercedes. And what did you do in that intervening period? Because I think this is, again, valuable for people who are never going to race in motorsport, but have got an ambition and they know where they want to go. What did you do to stay on his radar? Like to kind of almost almost let him feel that he was part of your career even before you were signed. Do you know what I mean? Rather than just disappearing for a year and reappearing, which I think some people would do. Yeah, so he, he actually gave me some advice to join a certain team in Formula 3. So this was a German team who race with a Mercedes engine. So in, in Formula 3, there's two different engine manufacturers, uh, Mercedes and Volkswagen. This German team, he said, I think you should join this German team. Obviously, Mercedes backed. And I think it'd be a great place for you. So I uh, said, I appreciate your your opinion. And I, I went and did a test with them. And I ended up joining a British team called Carlin with a Volkswagen en- engine. So as soon as I signed with, with Carlin, I sent Toto an email just saying, I really... Um, thanked your advice did a test with with the German team but I felt like joining the British team with the VW engine would be better for my my future progress and I feel like I'd learn more with the British team than with the German team and he replied again straight away saying you know I sort of jokingly I think you're making the wrong decision but best of luck let's stay in touch and let's see how he gets on so I think having that follow-up email where it wasn't so formal in a way it was a bit more informal and I'd almost gone to against what he had advised he probably saw that um it's quite intriguing you know there's mm. you know this 17 year old kid now 16 year old kid who has almost gone in the opposite direction to, to what he advised but i gave a, a, a good reason for it you know i felt like the british team would would be better for me i think joining a german team at that age would have been a little bit tough even just with the language barrier and um and that was it until i think until december when there was an, an award ceremony and Toto was there and I thought, oh, this is my opportunity to go and speak with him again. And um, that's where it started. 
So it sounds to me like you've started to pull on a golden thread almost where it gives you a line of sight of, I know where I want to get to now. And it gives you a sense of direction. How frequently when you made a decision, whether it's the team that you joined in Formula 3 or it, like a particular decision about a race and how you're going to respond, were you thinking about what about what you were going to say to Toto or what Mercedes would perceive? I think um, going into that season, I just thought it's all results-based. I've almost done the groundwork now of putting those foundations with, with Mercedes, with Toto. I just need to go out there and perform. And I think it's as simple as that. I think you don't need to, as I said, those first conversations had started and those first two meetings went really, really well, even though there wasn't a contract on the table. Straight away, I felt like I had a good relationship with him and I had the confidence, you know, a year later to go at this award ceremony of the Autosport Awards to, to go up and just have a chat with him. And having performed, it gives you a lot of ammunition to uh, argue your case. So I think you've got to go out there, make your point, then almost leave it and then do the talking on the track yeah. or whatever industry it is you're in. But also a real belief in the decisions you're making. Like, are you doing all this at this point? Or are, is your dad going, George, send another email to Toto <laughs> or your mum while she's, you know, chatting to you at the dinner table. Yeah. She's going, have you messaged that guy from Mercedes again? Or is or are you kind of, again, as we've spoken about a couple of times already, in a kind of, in your own world, controlling your, your own destiny? Yeah, to be honest, most of this came from uh, my own my own thoughts yeah. really but I'm sure it's from the way I've been brought up from from my parents and I guess they always taught me you got to go out there and, and make it happen for yourself so even though it wasn't my father saying you know send this email to Toto I was sort of on my own accord going out there and, and trying to create these these opportunities and as I said it was only when I was 16 I recognized if I want to achieve my dream. And it wasn't just my dream, it was also my family's dream. Mm -hmm. There'd been so much sacrifice for my father, for my mother. You know, my father used to work every day, you know, half seven till half seven. Never saw him through the week. On a Friday night, we'd jump in the camper van, driving up and down the UK. And as a child, you don't really comprehend what's going on here. You know, why is dad not home for dinner tonight and tomorrow night and the day after? He's there working his socks off to you know, put food on the table, make a living to be able to afford to go go-kart racing. It's not straightforward. And as I said, I by that age of 16, I'd won again in Formula 4, but didn't really have the money to go and race in Formula 3. If I didn't have sponsorship, that could have been the end of a journey. So it's sort of now and in my court thinking, I've got to go and I've got to go and do something because clearly winning isn't just enough. Yeah. And what did that do in terms of your perception of pressure? So as you say, like you almost were naive to not appreciate, never seeing your dad and it's just the way things are. And then you say that realisation dawns of, shit, he's been working hard yeah. to give me these opportunities. Yeah, I don't really know how that played on me in terms of that additional pressure. I think for sure my father was very hard on me during my whole racing career. Go on, what do you mean by that? And we're just, I think in, in go-karting, you've got, my my father was my mechanic throughout my go-kart career. My mum used to write down all of the data on her little notepad, all the setups, all the lap times, everything logged in this pound fifty notepad from WH Smith or, or whatever. And it was so passionate for all of us. And, you know, they're standing on the sidelines, they're seeing me racing, seeing me succeed, but equally if I'm ever making a mistake. Because I think he was going through a lot of pressure, you know, work was not straightforward for him. All of that time and sacrifice he was making, if ever he saw his son going out there and not putting in the effort, you know, during the race weekend or, you know, I'm more interested playing football with my mates in between the sessions or messing around, you know, I guess that would probably wind him up quite a lot and he would... Uh, let me know about it because, you know, he's put in all this effort in for a reason. I need to go out there and, and show that it's worth it. And I can't be there dicking around, just having a good time when kind of we're here to win. But then does that affect the father-son dynamic? Is it more than coach, athlete? Yeah, I think so. I, yeah, I definitely probably didn't have the, 
the greatest relationship with my father through those Carton days because we were um, we were like a race team. We're not there. It was almost like we weren't there to um, have a good time. We were kind of there to win. And if we won, we had a good time, of course. And we'd always I remember we'd always stop off at KFC on the way home if ever we won a race. And as a kid, you know, I really enjoyed that. So that was kind of my reward at the end of a weekend if if you did a good job and obviously those moments are so special but equally on the flip side if it doesn't go to plan you know I felt it but then I would see it affecting my father and you know my mother maybe less so but yeah for sure that added yeah, yeah added an element of pressure and that's probably why when I got to a maturer age you know, you know 16 and realizing right you know, my father has been through not just 10 years of this with me, it's 10 years prior with my brother as well. You know, this is 20 years worth of you know passion and hard work. I need to almost pull my finger out now and and almost not, not let them down. And that's probably why even today when you don't have a great race weekend, you don't go out and mm. have some food with people. You kind of do, I guess, what you learned really yeah. in that period in your life, which was, you know, to try and process that. So... Th- it's been so interesting to hear that, you know, people think stuff comes for free. If you've got yeah. talent, you get into Formula One, right? That's clearly not the case right. here. You know, you've had to make these sacrifices, ha- have various little moments along the way where you've had to make the right decision and you do, and you end up in Formula One. And I'm watching from afar because this was interesting for me because obviously I was doing bits and pieces with Formula One as you were starting out on your journey. And then I watched you come through and, you know, you were the most successful young British driver for a period when there was some great British drivers. Alex Albon was, you know, based in the UK, racing yeah. under a Thai flag. And Landon Norris, obviously, at the same time. So I then remember watching your first season at Williams. But those guys are in a Red Bull and a McLaren and a picking up points, picking up podiums, and you're yeah. not. I'd love to know how that felt and how you processed that from being, as you described as a young guy, like you just won everything. That's what you yeah. did. And suddenly you weren't. Yeah, that was a really unique season for me, my first year in Formula One, joining Williams and a team that was on the brink of bankruptcy. And it was a team of every single race weekend, it was racing to survive. It wasn't racing to perform. Yeah. The team was racing to survive and the 800 people's jobs at stake and um, there was no doubt you know when I got to the first race in Australia I'm here in Formula One you know almost one dream accomplished and go out on track and we're four seconds off the pace yeah. the car's falling apart and we're being lapped two or three times kind of thinking to yourself you know is this the dream <laughs> in a way yeah. but I think I've always had quite a um, rational view to things and while seeing Alex in Red Bull scoring podiums and you know being the man to a degree and Lando equally always in the points and that was sort of difficult to digest because I'd just come from Formula 2 where I I beat them yeah. and now you know I've almost just been put how did you digest it? it I thought that even though they're finishing the points and they're scoring podiums I'm not here to score points or podiums I'm here to win and I want to win and even though they were finishing ahead of me I'm we're both we're all going through this journey towards together learning I was part of Mercedes and I felt like my time will come so it was I think every time you from a from a difficult situation you've got to try and look at the positives from it I was driving at the back of a grid kind of under the radar I was making a few mistakes that season but not many people noticed because people weren't the spotlight wasn't on me you know the spotlight was on the guys at the front equally the spotlight was on Lando and Alex and if ever they made a mistake the whole world knew about it so I saw this as an opportunity that you know I'm in Formula 1 going to 21 different countries 21 different races uh, different circuits this is my opportunity to learn and perhaps try things that for example Alex and Lando didn't have the opportunity to because the spotlight was on yeah. every single weekend was but also you couldn't have done these things either because you and previous seasons were racing for titles and championships uh, every year so you had no exploration behind the wheel did you no absolutely I think um and that was a real mentality change for me I had a teammate uh, in Robert Kubica who 
had a horrific accident in 2011, I think it was. And he'd been out of an F1 car for, for a long, long time. And he had a very difficult season. So I was almost racing in no man's land. But there was this one race in Monaco. I was driving around. I was ahead of Robert by quite quite a quite a margin. I was behind the, the next gaggle of cars. And I kind of thought to myself, I'm just going to bring the car home because what's the point in risking it? You know, I've kind of achieved all I could all I can in this race. I can't beat the cars ahead. I've already beaten the car behind. Bring it home. And there was a moment in that race that I thought, this will teach me nothing. If I just drive around for the next hour and a half, just bring in the car home. This isn't going to help me in one year time, two years time, three years time. If ever I'm racing for a Mercedes, if ever I'm racing for a race win or world championships. So I just sort of turned up and just went absolutely flat out every single lap around Monaco, kind of risking everything for 19th position on the grid because I felt like that's what I needed to do yeah. Yeah. if I wanted to learn and progress. And it's from that moment on for the rest of the season, that sort of every single race, every single qualifying, every single session was this opportunity for me to build a you know, greater toolbox of experience for me to, to wow. tap into for whenever I needed it in the future. I love that because that's something that, as I'm listening to it, is the first time you're almost driving without pressure yeah. because there's no expectation on yours yeah. has previously come. And then you find pressure within, you put yourself under some kind of pressure. Yeah, it was, I was racing against myself. Yeah. You know, I, I stopped thinking about my teammate and I stopped thinking about everyone else because we were so far behind, we couldn't compete with anybody else. So I was purely competing with myself and I'd have races or sessions where I finished 19th. I was ahead of my teammate behind everyone else. But I was really disappointed with my performance because I knew I could have done better. And for some of my team at the time, it was a little bit difficult to, to understand. You know, On paper, I'd finished in the same place as I finished last race, uh, finished ahead of my teammate again. All of those boxes were ticked but I knew I could have done better. And I think that's really helped me yeah. to develop from a you know this difficult situation. Yeah. I could have done that whole season, just two toured around, just beating my teammate, finishing behind the rest. And I'd have got to the following year. Then I'm slightly more in the game, but I've just wasted a whole season. So I think every single opportunity you've got, you've got to make the most of it. So tell us then, what did you learn about yourself in this season of discovery and and exploring your own limits. What's the biggest lesson that came out from that? I think the biggest lesson was probably success is all relative. You know, when I grew up as a young go-kart driver and going through the ranks of F4 to F F2, success was being on pole position and winning. And when I got to Formula One, that just was not achievable in the Williams in that season. So I couldn't come away from every single weekend being disappointed with myself because I've not been on pole and I've not won the race. You have to readjust your, not necessarily your goals, but your expectations. And you have to find your own successes. You know, I would celebrate when I was only half a second away from 15, uh, from, from 18th from the grid rather than being a second away because that was relative success. And for me, that was kind of like a pole position and if I didn't celebrate those moments, that 21 race season would have felt incredibly long. And that helped me to um, yeah, sort of get through that season and to progress as a driver. Are you glad that you had it? I think... I think so. I, I never want to look back and say um, things should have been different. I think every single opportunity, every single year, whether it's a good year or a bad year, adds to your sort of development and it made me who I am. Those experiences, if I was in a Mercedes fighting for victories, I wouldn't have had those mm. experiences. And I have probably been through in that regard, maybe more than what, you know, Alex or Lando has. You know, they've been in, Lando's been at McLaren now for five years. He's been fighting for the odd podium or pole position for five years now. Whereas I've been on sort of every end of the spectrum. Yeah. And you've got to see that as an advantage. Yeah. You know, he hasn't been right at the back of the grid. But equally, he's not been right at the front of the grid. 
in in McLaren, and it's no through no fault of his own. You know, Lando's an exceptional driver, but you know that's an advantage I've got to, got to take from that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think what you're describing there is fascinating. There's research on this that your brain respond like releases the chemicals to celebrate whatever your expectations are. So yeah. if you expect to get half a second quicker and you do it, yeah. your brain releases the same chemical that if you if it because you've hit your target. Well, so even if your target was to win the world title, you'd get the same chemical release as as fi- half a second where George faster. was finishing at that point, right? Yeah. So so how do you deal with like setting micro targets now? You know, rather than setting, I want to be the world champion. Yeah, sure. Rather than the small incremental steps, do you do that now? Yeah, I I think I I never like to look too far ahead. I like to take every single day. As it comes, and I believe that if I perform to my very best today, if I perform to my very best tomorrow, whether that's in the gym, whether that's you know talking with you guys, whether that's talking with my engineers, whether that's in the simulator, whether that's a Friday practice session, if I do the the best job possible that I can do every single day, I'll achieve that overall goal. So I never like to set you know this. Obviously, it's it's obvious I want to be a world champion. That yeah. it's too obvious to even set that as as a goal because it's that's what we're all here to do. You know, my goal was to wake up today and make sure that I do everything right, and go to bed thinking I couldn't have done yeah. more than I've done. And if I achieve that every single day, that that goal of world champion will come. See, we had a really interesting conversation with Johnny Wilkinson. Mm. What year were you born? Ninety eight. So you do you remember England winning the Rugby yeah. World Cup? You were yeah. five years old. You were young. I don't remember it, but I've, I've <laughs> you know the moment. The, yeah, I know the moment. How long do you reckon he said the thrill lasted? I think I listened to his his podcast. <laughs> so it was thirty seconds, yeah, right? Yeah. And what was really interesting with that conversation was that was the moment where he realised that life isn't about having that moment where the light shines and you're the world champion and then yeah. suddenly you're happy. That's delaying happiness till you get to that moment. And I think what you're talking about here is you've realised as he has. But he only realised it after yeah. setting that huge goal, achieving it and realising it wasn't actually going to give him a thrill or any length of fulfilment. It's yeah. about being totally in the moment all the time. So, you know, when we're having this conversation, you can give it 50%, but it won't fulfil us. It won't fulfil yeah. you. It won't fulfil anyone. And then you go on to the next thing. And if you give that kind of 50% because all you're thinking about is winning the world title, your whole life will be missed opportunities, yeah flat experiences, yeah, absolutely dull moments. And then guess what? If you don't win the world title, what a waste it's been yeah. changing everything for that moment. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And I'll always remember, I got obviously such an opportunity when um, I jumped in for, for Lewis in 2020. And obviously he came down with, with COVID and jumped in last minute into the Mercedes. They would, they'd already won the world championship. They were, that was probably their most dominant race car they ever produced and I'm coming from a Williams that I was finishing 19th every single race weekend didn't score any points thrown into that car and I qualified second 20 milliseconds behind my teammate and I was disappointed and that was just such a learning for me thinking you know this is my best qualifier I've never qualified inside the top 10 I've just missed out on pole position by 20 milliseconds and I'm disappointed with that because for me I felt like I could have done better. The the expectation had changed. And even though that was by far better than anything I'd I'd achieved yeah. previously, it wasn't it wasn't all that. When did you realise that? Is this a long period after or is that at the at the time you thought, why am I feeling like this? I think it was straight away. Right. I well straight away I was disappointed with with second. And it was probably that evening I realised that winning probably isn't everything in terms of fulfilling that happiness. I want to win more than anything. But if you're going out there to achieve happiness, winning will give that to you for a short period of time. But that's you can't live your life in that, uh, as you said, that that equation of thinking happiness is from, from winning. And... You win once, you want to win two times. You win two times, you want to win three times. You, If you win five races in a season, you want to win every race in a season. If, if you're not winning a world championship, you know, it's, it's never ending. And I think that's what I've 
I've learned on this this journey and why maybe those three years at Williams for me, I dealt with quite well because, as I said, I wanted to be a world champion and seeing sort of my rivals in Alex and Lando having uh, relatively a bit more success in the, in the interim, they weren't winning either. And if you're not winning, it's almost, you know, they're they'd already been content with their points finishes. They'd finished in the points almost every single race. They were disappointed with not getting podiums. Then Alex scored a few podiums. He's then disappointed that he's not winning. And it's, I think it's never going to stop. You know, I'm yet to win a race. I'm working my ass off to to try and win a race. You know, when I win one race, I'm not going to say that's my life fulfilled. It's, you know, I want to win another another race and another race. And then it's, I want to win the championship. When you win one championship, you want to win another championship. So it's um, you need to find that way of balancing professional life and trying to get that success, but also trying to find your happiness. Yeah. Potentially somewhere somewhere else as well, because yeah. it's um, probably if you're looking for that in your profession yeah. and just from pure success, I don't think you're going to achieve it. I think that's a fascinating insight to reach because especially I'm thinking of you've left school at 14. You know, like there, there may be lessons that you learn by doing exams way. or going through a process like that, or yeah. like less bruising experiences, like your first girlfriend, or like <laughs> falling out with a group of friends at school, and yet you're having to learn this in the bright lights of Formula One. Yeah, I think leaving school at fourteen had its pros and cons. I obviously so as i said leaving that social life and people of the same age as me and and friends was obviously difficult but then i was always surrounded by people who were in their mid to late 20s you know my um when i was racing professionally go karting my my go kart mechanics when i was in formula 4 my race engineer who was you know, 50 years old dealing with people at such a young age who have experienced so much in life experienced so much within that sport and you ne- didn't necessarily have the bad influence around to mess about. I was terrible at school. I used to always sit at the back and mess around with my friends. Um, whereas if I was in that classroom on my own, directly with the teacher, I wouldn't have been doing yeah. that. And I'd have been so focused in educating myself and, and trying to be a better, better person. And that was kind of going from one extreme from my school education of being this kid who messed around, who was always at the headmaster's office, to a kid who's now working hard with his you know, 50-year-old engineer to try and be a better racing driver and going you know, for dinner with with him and the mechanics who are in their 30s or late 20s who are living a very different life to what I would have been living at the age of 14 and 15. So you've had qualifying in the Mercedes. You finished second. Thankfully, you've processed the fact that's not a failure and yeah. you know you can be happy at all times regardless of what's happening but then comes race day and that amazing start you had where you sent it down the inside of Valtteri and took the lead in that race could you talk us through the the process you went through that evening after you'd processed qualifying that morning and where when how conscious was the decision that that's how you were going to start the race you know you were going to kind of almost like lay a marker down in that moment against a guy who, let's be clear, you wanted his seat, right? Yeah. And this was the first chance in your whole career to be judged against him. <laughs> yeah. I think that whole weekend I went in with the mentality that I've got nothing to lose. You know, he's the driver who's been in that car for four years now, done the whole season in that race car. This is his 17th race of the season, I think it was. I'm coming in, got called up on a Wednesday afternoon. If I finish behind him, I'm expecting to finish behind him because of the the circumstances but if I beat him that's huge and that I think fueled my motivation of thinking wow what an opportunity I've got here I've got nothing to lose and I can just go for it and I think waking up on Sunday morning I just think it's just it's just another race even though this was the biggest race of my career at that point it was just another race and I think that's something I've tried to take forward is sort of every opportunity, every race, you can't build it up into something that's more than what it is. You do these practice days, you do your training sessions, you go through that process. And if you're going to qualify and all hyped up, this is qualifying, I need to go out there, this is the biggest qualifying of my career. I feel a bit anxious and a bit tight and a bit stressed in that scenario. Whereas 
I treat it like a practice session. You know, every training session I do, every practice session I do, I'm going to, I'm trying to be the best I can. I'm trying to drive as fast as I can. So when I get to qualifying now, I'm just going to do the same as what I did in training. When I get to the race now, I'm going to do the same as what I did in training because I train to do the very best possible. So for me, that was just another race. And as soon as the helmet was on and you're on that starting grid, there was no one in front of me other than obviously my teammate in Valtteri, but there was no cars directly ahead. It just felt like another race. And it was incredible how that mentality was, you know, you're just looking at those start lights. I've got to make a good start and I've got to try and overtake it turn one. And that's the exact same men- mentality as I had from starting second there on pole position at, at one of the races this year or when I started last with, with Williams. I think there's something about intentionality here though as well, because I'm reminded as you're describing that, that experience you said when you were 14 and you went, I'm going to beat that guy on that last, on that yeah. bend yeah. on in the last lap where you're going in and imposing yourself on a situation. So although you, you calm because it's just another race, there's something about imposing yourself and imposing your will on a situation. How, how conscious was that, that you're now in a, in a place where you can go in and impose yourself on that race? I think you, you recognize certain circumstances are obviously bigger than others and you want to try and do big things. So I knew if I've got half an opportunity, I'm absolutely going to go for it because you need to, that, that is the moment where the spotlight truly is on. Even though you'd go in with the same mentality when the spotlight wasn't, that you realize, you know, you've you've got to go for that that opportunity as such. And um, yeah, as I said, as soon as you you launch off the line and you see half an opportunity, you know, this is the guy who I'm battling for that race seat for you know the following year or two years later. I can't leave anything off the table, and I don't want to come away with any regrets. You know, it's. Um, yeah, it was it was a very unique circumstance to be in, and especially yeah. as I said, you know, battling directly with the guy you're trying to to take his seat from. Well, it felt like a fairy tale. I remember at the time thinking, this guy's been supported by Mercedes. He's done mm. the hard yards. He's been in the Williams. This strange opportunity has come about because of a global pandemic that's you know yeah. struck down one of the drivers. Now he's in the lead. This was always meant to be. <laughs> Uh, but that's, that's not it the way this story didn't, No, it didn't quite pan out that way. You know, I got a puncher in that race. Um, well, effectively lost, lost a victory through a puncher. But by having that puncher in the race, it also gave me an opportunity to carve my way back through the field and yeah, overtake Valtteri again, which in a way was almost a bigger statement than what it would have been had I just won the race and cleared off into the distance. And... I obviously finished that race incredibly disappointed and upset that I wasn't standing on the top step of that podium. But probably within 24 hours, I thought perhaps this is a blessing in disguise. You know, I had such an opportunity to to show what I was capable of. There's, um, I think if I just went out there and won that race, probably the respect wouldn't have been there because it almost would have been too easy. Whereas people saw me fight for every single opportunity. They saw me fight at the start. They saw me fight back through the field. They saw that passion of when I got the puncher. And it felt felt like the people watching was on that journey with me. And, you know, it's two years. That was two years ago. It feels like yesterday. But if I won that race, I'd have been a one-time Formula One winner. It would not have changed anything for me. And even though it would have meant the world at the time, you know, I'm here to try and be a Formula One world champion and I would be no happier or sadder today yeah. had I won that race. So it was quite quite an in- intriguing uh, thought. You might not want to answer this with total honesty, but I'd love it if you did. Did you think that the performance you put in that day meant at the end of the season you'd be in that Mercedes? Yeah, I... I always believed I'd I'd be in the Mercedes and and Toto made it very clear, just go out, perform and leave the rest to me. And that wasn't that weekend. That was throughout my whole career. 
when I was racing in Formula 3, he said, go and win, I'll sort the rest. I won, he sorted the rest, I raced yeah. F2. Go and win, and you'll be in F1 next year. I won, and I was in F1, and he had the same mentality. He knew I wanted to be in a Mercedes. Mercedes was the seat that every single F1 driver wanted to be in. And he made it clear, go and perform, and you'll be in the car. Yeah, but you did perform, and you didn't. Well, I had I had a three year contract with, <clears throat> right. with Williams, so that was that was probably the the biggest difficulty. Is when we signed for Williams, they were a team who were fighting for podiums, fighting for pole positions. They had one bad year in two thousand eighteen, but we thought that was yeah. you know a one off, and they'd be back to not winning ways, but you know fighting in that mid pack. And um, Claire Williams, who ran the team at the time, she kind of had had us by the balls let's say and um you know that was the only opportunity to get into formula one that was a, the last remaining seat she basically said it's three years or or nothing right so you obviously went for it and we thought at the time three years with williams it's not going to be a bad place because you know they've been fighting for podiums for the, for the previous four years they had a bad year in 2018 but you know it's a new yeah. season they could be back to to some some good ways and then we so, soon learned that it was a difficult situation for yeah. the team and they had difficulty with sponsorship. They had a sponsor pull out, the pandemic came. And as I said, it was a battle of survival for them. But it, it would have been hard, I imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, to to get that your first ever taste of a competitive Formula One car and then go back, not just for a few more races, but an, an entire season, <laughs> like hungry man like yeah wanting that back all the yeah, time absolutely i think again it's um once you've got that opportunity it motivates you to to fight even harder to make sure you're there always and i remember the first time i ever drove a formula one car was in when i was 17 years old that speed and thrill i got from experiencing that formula one car i always wanted to be a formula one driver but i had added motivation and fire within my stomach to achieve that because that was just such an awesome experience. And the same with, you know, almost been on pole, probably should have won in a race if we didn't get a puncher. That was such an experience and what I'd almost dreamt of my whole life. I wanted that every single yeah. weekend. So, you know, I went out the following year and 2021 was probably my most competitive year in, in Formula One. But obviously that was the year when you had that coming together with Valtteri, right? Mm, it was. Because... Um, what happened when you stood in for Lewis was kind of out of your control and was great for you. Yeah. And I think the general perception was that that moment wasn't great for you. How how was it from your perspective, that, that moment against Valtteri? And I'm interested also in how Mercedes and Toto dealt with that because that was almost the first time that maybe there was a difficult When we came together and, yeah, it was obviously crashing into the driver whose seat you're trying to take and the team who have supported you your whole career. <laughs> that it's, wasn't on the plan, it right? Wasn't, it definitely wasn't on the plan, but I think it's where those sort of killer instincts come in because I was a Williams driver. The thing with with Williams is I'd, I'd been there for two years. We'd scored zero points. The teams who finish eighth, ninth, tenth in the championship, they often don't score more than 10 points in a whole season. So if you ever get that one opportunity to score one or two points, that is huge for the team. And also financially, if you could finish ninth or eighth in the Constructors' Championship, you're talking tens of millions of dollars in prize money extra you're given. So this is a team that's struggling to survive on the brink of bankruptcy. I'm in a race, I'm in 11th position. And when you're in a car like that, you've got to put it, all on the line. You're not going to score points if you're conservative and play Mr. Consistent as you probably would, you know, in Mercedes this year, as I've almost done this year, I've consistently got those results week in, week week out, getting a lot of points on the on the scoreboard and everything's looking okay. You know, Williams, if you got half an opportunity, you had to absolutely go for it. And that was the mentality there. You got to go for it. And it didn't even really cross my mind that it was Valtteri and a Mercedes. That was an opening to score points for myself, for my team. And I had to go for it. But it was probably that moment I was spinning sideways <laughs> through the grass at 200 miles an hour. It I, Maybe I was thinking something different, but equally I was, as I said, I was, I was a Williams driver, even though Mercedes 
supported me. I was there fighting for my team. What did you think when you realised who it was that you'd had a coming together with? Um, well, that was, I mean, initially I thought it, it was quite a scary moment because I'd never crashed at that speed before. I was doing 330 kilometres an hour, uh, DRS open, got on a wet patch and the car just spun. And I'm going sideways down the track, carbon fibre flying everywhere. I can't see to my right because you're kind of locked in the cockpit. I don't know what I'm going to hit and I'm sort of bracing for impact. Fortunately enough, the overall impact wasn't too bad and we sort of um, slowed down into the gravel and hit the barrier slightly. Your initial reaction, you got so much adrenaline. As I said, you're crashing at 200 miles an hour. I was sort of furious. I, at first, I was furious with Valtteri, which was probably not the right thing to do uh, because that was an opportunity that I saw that has now just disappeared. You know, it wasn't that I've just crashed into to Valtteri or Mercedes. It's that is points that we've lost. And I thought that he'd lost for us. And that was probably also a lesson for me that you need to look at the overall picture from other uh, people's view before taking a yeah. snap judgment. And I was, you know, very hot headed and went over and, you know, he was also hot headed, you know, middle fingers were flying and <laughs> the the F and the C words were being thrown around and it was all a bit of a, not a very pleasant situation. And I was in the media pen afterwards, just quite hot headed and didn't have a moment to reflect on it. And that was also a really good learning for me. You know, if ever I'm in that situation again, which I probably will be at some point in my yeah. career, I'm not going to have the rest of my career without having an incident, you know, at high speed you need to take a moment to, to think about it before yeah. snap judgments. But when it comes to Mercedes, I didn't really know what to think. Um, I was flying home with Toto that evening. It was always the case. So, you know, the one flight that I take with him a year, it was that, that one. And he was obviously, he was, he was, he was very um, upset with the situation and pretty pretty angry also because that was the very first year of this new financial cost cap that had been implemented and the damage that occurred in that yeah. incident for Mercedes was I think one and a half million dollars. So that's one and a half million dollars taken away from the sort of overall budget. So he was obviously very uh, upset and frustrated about that. And then when you're seeing headlines, you know, George Russell crashes into Mercedes driver. These are not headlines you want to be seeing. So it was all just a messy, not a good situation. Yeah. We left it for the following day. And then I went around to his house for lunch on, on Saturday and talked over and and everything was, was no problem at all. And, and we moved on from it. So I feel like situations like that, you almost grow together. It sort of pulls you closer and... Um, I actually, as it happened, built a probably closer relationship with Valtteri's group of engineers and, and team because I knew them already, but they all knew that there was a potential that I'd be replacing him. They're actually my team today. Mm -hmm. And I you know, went over, I called them all and said, look, I'm really sorry for what happened on Sunday. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work just for, for the, on the you got them together. Yeah. No, or it was it was only them? it was only it was only sort of the the, the chief mechanic and uh, chief engineer for him. Yeah. So I spoke to them both. Just uh, you know, really sorry for how how that panned out. And they said, look, That's don't worry about it. And um, was that suggested by Toto? Or you no, to it that? was. To be honest, I'm not too sure where where it came from. I knew all of these guys anyway because I'd right. been I was a junior driver for Mercedes, so. You know, I'd often flown with the Mercedes team. I had good, a good relationship with everyone. So it wasn't a sort of difficult thing to, to to come by. But obviously a strange dynamic. I'm a Williams driver crashing into a Mercedes driver. And then I'm sort of on the phone to the Mercedes team saying, look, I'm sorry for how that, that panned out. But, you know, I feel I'm almost glad for that crash because I feel better for it. You know, I feel a more rounded person. I see things maybe slightly differently. And these moments in life, I guess, mature you. You know, there's there's no perfect moments and you need mistakes to grow. Was there ever a fear from you that it would cost you to drive? No, 
to be honest, uh, because my argument was, you know, I was in in that in a position that was better than where the Williams should be, and he was in a position worse than where the Mercedes should be at the time. So I kind of naively and selfishly use that incident as almost uh, an argument yeah. for me which well, a chance is, to remind them that their current driver was further back than he should have yeah, been. yeah yeah so you know it's um <laughs> very clever it's but that's i guess you can look at it from yeah. from so many different angles and whether the crash was my fault whether it was it, it wasn't his fault but it was there was an opportunity there it was a very audacious overtake attempt and Toto actually said, you know, a couple of days later, he admired the fact that when I was sort of spinning out, I was still flat out on the throttle, going sideways through the, through the, the grass towards the wall at 200 miles an hour, and sort of said that shows the sort of driver who I am. So even though from these difficult negative situations, there's always a positive that comes from it. I'm intrigued by that journey back with Toto the night yeah. after that crash, and I'm hearing parallels of the journey back with your dad and your mum in the car after <laughs> those weekends when you're yeah. not getting KFC. Yeah. And that one leads me to want to explore that relationship and the parallels between your dad and Toto. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I mean, I've, I've seen some videos of Toto with his son go-karting recently and there probably are some parallels there between my father and, and Toto as a father to... To, to his son but like what put me on the spot here um you know you're you i think you live this with your son in that journey so if they're not succeeding you're also not succeeding and that was the case when i was sort of driving if i didn't win a race that was obviously a failure for me and i felt that but my father felt that but i think then when you've got that added personal investment you know at the time for my father it was the financial side you know it was whether I've had a crash and damaged the car uh, the cart or just not won the race you almost feel like what was all that work what I spent you know god knows how much for nothing for Toto during the race weekend it's obviously he's you know he part owns the team but also he's there to win and that's that incident was um going to compromise the team slightly for for the season so he felt that frustration as well and almost um disappointment so we almost both felt the failures as such but for different reasons sure. so in a way yeah. you know when i came back from the cart track with my father and i hadn't won i was upset but he was sort of very upset that was kind of a similar with toto and i you know i was obviously upset the fact that i had lost points for williams he was very upset that I had had the crash, probably how I conducted myself, but more so the fact that Valtteri didn't score points and it's damaged the cars and the team's going to have to work a lot harder and it's going to potentially compromise their season slightly. So, yeah, there's definitely some parallels, no doubt. Because when we interviewed just Capito, he spoke to us about his dad was similar, uh, as in he'd funded him when he was coming through the ranks and he described how his dad wouldn't speak to him for a week. Mm if he lost and he now has this mantra that second place is nowhere yeah. that you, you either win or you're nothing. And he described how that was actually a real source of strength to him yeah. through his career. Do you think that gave you strength or do you think you could have benefited from say having a, like your dad or Toto as you put an arm around your shoulder and comfort you and help you process that loss? At the time, I definitely didn't think it was, I didn't think it was beneficial, but now I look back and I, I really do. I definitely would not have changed one single way how my father sort of um, raised me and took care of me during my karting career. And even on those times where, you know, there were tears, you know, for sure as a, as a young kid and you feel like you've let your, your dad down. Um, but that definitely made me stronger and, you always want that love and affection, of course, but what was I chasing in my life? Was I chasing love and affection or was I chasing trying to be a Formula One world champion? And, you know, we as a family was trying to chase being a Formula One world sure. champion. 
But I'm intrigued as, as how it affects your wider relationships now. Like if you're in a, it, like, like with a partner yeah. and they're upset, yeah. like, like we often learn from our parents or the example around us. Yeah. Do, do you have the capacity to be able to comfort people when they're struggling or do, or is it more that same mindset of just get on with it? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, Toto said to me after that crash, you know, I am hardest on the ones I care about most. And yeah, that sort of resonated with me a little bit. And, you know, whether, you know, my girlfriend or my family or whatever, if they're going through a tough time, whether it's work or personal, whatever, I think you need to strike that right balance. You know, my my girlfriend is works in finance. It's definitely not a, an easy industry to work in a lot of long hours. And, you know, after a tough day, of course, you want to, to give love and affection and put your arm around them, but equally... I want to see her succeed and I know what she's capable of. And sometimes you do need someone to um, look at things from a different perspective. Yeah. And, you know, my father, he, with his mentality, he's been hard on me because he only wants the best for me. Sure. And I totally agree and believe in that. And it might be something in the time you don't recognize, but I guess you may be thankful for later down the line. Uh, down the line. Yeah. We we often have a phrase because this is a very common conversation with people who've reached your level in life that just because something is hard for you doesn't yeah. mean it's bad for you. No, absolutely. And I think we've gone through many moments that have been hard but not bad. Yeah, I think I have learned the most in my life from my failures and my most difficult moments. I feel like success and victory is such an easy thing to deal with. No one needs to know how to celebrate a success. If you achieve something, you're elated, you're so happy, let's go and celebrate, let's have a glass of champagne or whatever. But often you don't sort of take away any learnings from that. And in the moment, it feels so great and you feel like you've accomplished so much. But perhaps it's not going to add much benefit later down the line. Maybe it will and you'll continue on that path and, and great if you do. But those failures are the times where you really question yourself, your processes. Am I doing this right? Could I be doing this better? I don't want to experience that ever again. Yeah. I get more motivation from failing to never feel that again than when I do from succeeding. You know, I've, I've not had a lot of success this season, but when I scored pole, uh, pole position in Hungary, that was such an elation and such a great feeling. I obviously had motivation to, I want to achieve that again and experience that. But if I compare it with Singapore or Silverstone when I had a terrible race weekend I feel stronger about not having the weekends like Silverstone and Singapore than having that's interesting you know it's um that success so what's more effective for you play it like racing to win or racing not to lose uh, it's definitely all, all about racing to win but I think in terms of your progress you need to lose to be able to win and I think this year, I've had a little bit of, I've had some failure, I've had a small amount of success. Across the road, it's been quite a, I don't know what the right word is, but it's, you know, Mercedes, we're here to to win. They've won the championship for the last eight years. And obviously, we haven't, we've yet to score a victory this season. So that's not been where we've wanted to achieve. But we've been very consistent, we've achieved the results, and we've been solid. But we're not here to be solid we are here to win and I think you need to put it all on the line sometimes to get it right but equally when you get it wrong that's where you progress the most in my opinion I wonder whether um actually the speed of the Mercedes has been a benefit to you this year because I'm, I'm sure that when you first <laughs> went out in pre-season you were like oh this is the title winning car this yeah. isn't going to win a title but if you and Lewis were battling for race wins battling for titles then very quickly you can have a divide very quickly. You've seen it. We've all seen it over the years. Whereas actually when you have a car that is second, third, fourth fastest and you want to get first, second fastest, yeah. the only way to do that is unity, working together, collaboration, understanding, empathy, compassion for each other. Can we talk about that? Yeah, 100%. I think 
for sure the dynamic would have been slightly different had we arrived at the first race and had the fastest car on the grid. Um, a lot of questions were asked. A lot of there's been a huge amount of late nights throughout this season. A lot of uh, tension at times between drivers, teams, designers. Um, uh, with regards to are we on the right tracks? Do we need to be doing something different? Do we need to be more drastic? Do we need to follow the same path as what we're on and just uh, continue doing what we we know best? And these were very sort of difficult conversations, but we come away from them sort of growing closer together. And we've got you know such great leadership within Mercedes that we are now all pushing in one direction whereas perhaps if you arrived at the very first race and the car was the quickest again you go back to this this thought of everything's a little bit too easy and those relationships are there but they maybe aren't as strong as as they could be uh, you go through a bit of success but is it going to be long-term mm. success or just short-term success so i truly believe this experience we've been through this year will lead to more long-term success who knows what would have happened if we had a race winning car from day one but i think we've unlocked things about our car learned things about our car our engine that perhaps would have maybe been swept under the carpet if the overall performance was better but these small details are going to bring yeah. even more performance yeah. i hope as soon as next year and these moments of conflict that you talk about which all elite teams need to go through yeah. to be successful. Can you explain how you find your role in that? Because you come into a team age 24, you've got one of the most successful Formula 1 drivers the sport's ever seen, the most successful boss, uh, boss the sport has ever seen, the most successful team in recent seasons. So how do you work out what your voice is, where you fit into that group? And and to, build, to have the confidence to say in front of those people, no, guys, listen to me. Yeah, it's, it's definitely been a unique experience going from Williams where I was the sort of experienced driver from the two to joining Mercedes, you know, being teammates with, with Lewis Hamilton. Uh, he's been at his team for 10 years now. I came in with the mentality that I wanted to listen and observe to see how these guys do it before showcasing sort of what my voice bringing my voice forward too much too soon because these guys have been through so much success together i personally was just quite intrigued to see how that dynamic yeah. worked and what i can learn from that while in the meantime building the relationships trying to do your talking on the track and i think you need to gain respect from everybody uh, within the organization and I think that respect comes from the hard work you put in it comes from your performance on track most of the time it doesn't come from necessarily the things you have to say and I think there's there's a big part of this is almost never sort of trying to bullshit your way you know it's it is sometimes intimidating if you get asked a question from uh, a chief designer who's been at the company for 25 years you feel like you have to answer yeah. something. Yeah. Whereas sometimes the best thing you can say is, to be honest, I'm not too sure. And, and you've had to learn that. Did you? Were you at a point in your career where you were kind of trying to give an answer and you weren't? Yeah, to a degree. I think when you're a bit younger and you don't really know how to find your feet, yeah. sometimes you feel like you can't, you know, I don't want to sound stupid here. I don't want to say that I don't know because surely I must know. But by having those open and honest conversations... I think also sometimes being very self-critical is a way of building that respect between this organization. Because if I can sort of uh, be critical about my own performance, maybe sort of other people within the organization will think, well, you know, he's out there and he's critical about himself in one small detail. He's yeah. clearly trying to push himself to be the very, very best. I need to also do that too. And you you try and push one another in that regard and you build these relationships and going through those difficult moments, I think you all grow closer together. So now, you know, I feel a fully part of this team and I think there's a huge amount of respect 
between all of us, also between Lewis and I, Toto and I. And the dynamic is is probably better than I ever would have expected. And is there a single moment that you can pinpoint that would give our listeners an insight into the Mercedes way? I think teamwork is is the biggest thing I've taken away from this this organization. It's so from from the top down, it's so well structured. Every single person knows exactly what their role is, who they report into, how they work together with their teammates. And we're, you know, we have 2,000 people work for Mercedes F1 between the car and the engine. Absolutely everybody needs to be um, collaborating to to make that machine work. And I think there's not one example I can, I can sort of give um, that can can define that but it's something I've been to be honest I'm still every single race I go to I'm just so impressed with how the team works and why I have so much faith and confidence that we will return as a team to the top because it is truly impressive how this this organization is so sort of seamless but the reason I ask is because when we interviewed Toto he told us about his very first visit to Mm. Mercedes and he and it was the dirty coffee cups and the yeah. days old newspapers in the reception yeah. told him that things needed to change because he said you can't ask for attention to detail when that isn't evident even in the reception area and that's why I'm wondering is there a moment where when you walked in you thought I'm in a really high performing team here I think there are things as simple as you know making sure there's not coffee cup stains on on the table everything is clean and immaculate and there is a way about that team is that if you're working for Mercedes, you know, you're working for Mercedes. That is that truly means something, and you have to every single day bring bring your A game. And I think you know, even you know, every everybody there dresses incredibly well. They're smart. They're always on time, and that's just that's not through um, people forcing them to be like that. That is because that's how they want to be to be part of of this team. Um, yeah, every single detail is is taken care of. Even, you know, when it when it was I remember at, at Christmas when they was getting the, the Christmas trees up, you know, the, the Christmas trees were chosen specifically, you know, trying to get the nicest, best Christmas trees, the lights, you know, there's a lot of thought going into the Christmas tree and the, the lights and the decorations within the factory to bring that um that nice feeling into the workplace and you know making people want to come to work and i think these are small things that people wouldn't even consider in a, sure. in another workplace no nice. it's like how you do anything is how you do everything absolutely i want to talk to you about when you first shared the team with lewis because one of the standout things for me in this conversation is how you've learned all the time from everything good bad successful unsuccessful you are a sponge of information from others what would you say three quarters of the way through your first season with Lewis is the the thing you've learned the most from someone that has won as many world titles as him? L- Lewis is an incredibly unique character. I think he's incredibly inspiring with all of his sort of activities and projects he has off circuit. He wouldn't be... Um, when you look at maybe drivers from the past who are just pure racing drivers, I'm going to wake up living and breathing this sport. And he does things so differently yeah. to so many other people yet has still had so much success along the way. And You mean he doesn't fit in the traditional mold of how a Formula 1 driver yeah, is? I, yeah, I'd say so. And yet he still had yeah. so much success. And I think I've used this analogy before, but when I look at, Federer, Nadal and, and Djokovic, you know, these are three greats of the sport. Statistically, you know, they've all basically achieved exactly the same achievements. Yet they have three totally different ways of playing. I'm sure they train differently. When you watch them, they look different. When you see them on court, you know, they they excel on on different on different courts or or playing fields or, or whatever. Yet they're three greats and 
I think the thing I take away from that and also from what I take away from Lewis is that there is no one path to success. I think you need to find your own path, your own journey. You need to have that self-belief that even if somebody is, is going down a certain path, you need to follow your own course and you need to do what is best for you. That's really nice. And go on. Well, go on. I was going to ask, I was going to ask you referenced uh, the tennis players, Federer, Nadal and Djokovic. And I think we see lots of parallels there. Formula One's a sport where there's no coaches. Yeah. Now, I know you recently spent some time with Federer and Andy Murray. What did that teach you? What did you learn from that experience of meeting those guys? I think what I learned is that, firstly, they are just great, humble, grounded people. And I think this is something we can never forget. I think um, we all live this crazy lifestyle, especially Formula One. You're going to you know, 23 different countries the fans there are incredible. You, you're you racing you know, these these machines around racetracks over 200 miles an hour. You're in this bubble of something that isn't real life to a degree. And I think meeting somebody like Roger, who has gone through so much success, so much fame along the way, yet is still just such a, down to worth, humble guy, gave me so much respect for him and, you know, hearing, you know, where he lives and what he gets up to on his sort of day-to-day life, spending a lot of time with, with the family. It sort of brings it back to you that you you need this in your routine. You need that element of... um something something that you know something that you know takes you away from from it all so you can come back and perform at your very very best and um what's yours i think for me it's it's spending time with my my family and and friends when i come back from a racetrack to be honest the place where i'd like to be is always my parents house in the countryside away from everything no phone signal and just really sort of disconnect and sort of spend quality time with with the people who I care about the most. When I was working in Formula One, Jensen Button was, you know, winning world titles and he had a very tight group of mates that went absolutely everywhere with him and they were yeah. like his safety net. And I know that you work with your sister. She's yeah. been part of your kind of backroom setup and you don't make a big deal of it. You know, we don't see her on the telly or anything, but I wonder whether that is a kind of, that constant grounding for you at a race weekend that that person that was there right back in the karting days is still yeah, there absolutely. for you. It's, yeah, as you say, I work, with my sister and she's always there for me 24 seven, even though, you know, most of the time when we talk, it's professional. We're not talking as brother and sister. Having her there is something who I've, some, someone who I've had for 24 years of my life. And also my manager, Harry, Harry was my manager from when I left go-karting in 2013. He was there from, from day one. When I signed for Mercedes, they took over everything. So Harry and I sort of parted away for a couple of years. And two years ago, I said to, to the team at Mercedes, I'd really like to bring Harry back into sort of my group yeah. of people around because he's somebody who I trust um, so much and who I think would be really beneficial for me trying to sort of grow on my, on my journey. So, yeah. you know, having my sister, having Harry, having my family, these are people who have always been there from day one and you you know what they're about and do they have a, do you have any agreement in place that when you're getting a little bit carried away or you've gone too far down the rabbit hole of this fantasy world that you live in do they have anything in place to be able to pull you back out I don't think so I think I've never fortunately found myself in that position and um, you know I try and speak with my family as as much as possible and I think that helps to stay grounded. You know, even this morning I was on FaceTime to my brother and his two kids on the way to school and every single race on FaceTime to my parents, they try and get out to as many races as possible, but still having that familiarity when you're away from home, when you're in Singapore, when you're in Japan, when you're in Austin, when you're in Mexico, it's a crazy 
it is a crazy life and I have to sort of pinch myself sometimes. But I think that's one of the the benefits of you know today's technology is you're only yeah. a, a touch away from, from home. Nice. And before we do our quick fire questions, I just want to know whether you're remembering to really enjoy it as well. I remember, you know, it was Lando, wasn't it, a while ago. It was tongue in cheek. He said, you're not fun anymore. Yeah. When you got into Formula 1, it is so serious. The stakes are so high. We've had a conversation about a crash that cost the team that you wanted to drive for a million and a half dollars. Like, is there still space for enjoyment and for fun or is it all too high a level for that? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I joked with him that it was quite fun standing on the podium seven times this year to, <laughs> <laughs> to his one. But anyway, yeah, it's, it's um, no, of course there's time time for fun, but yeah. it's all it's all got to be in the right the right moments, and you can't be out, you know, the Thursday before a race weekend having a load of fun, going for fancy dinners or whatever. But some world champions it, have done that, you know. Some world champions have done that, but it's um, you know, when you're trying to aspire to yeah. be one, you've got to be on that right journey and there's a time and place for everything right um quick fire questions what are the three non-negotiables that you and the people around you have to buy into to to be part of your world non-negotiables i think you need to accept that i'm going to be incredibly dedicated yep to what i do can't be a dick good got to be a nice nice person and yeah, got to be hum- humble. Yeah, yeah, definitely got to be humble and right. not not get carried away with with what what we're doing. Good. What's your biggest weakness and what's your greatest strength? Biggest weakness. Um, I'd say my biggest weakness is probably in the heat of the moment blaming others before looking at myself. I think it's it's very easy to have tunnel vision. Yep. And especially in, in the heat of battle. And if something goes wrong, goes against you, I think it's quite easy to jump onto that other person before having an opportunity to look at the full picture. So that's probably a weakness of mine that I need to improve and want to improve. Biggest strength, I think probably being dynamic to a situation. I think our life is constantly changing, whether it's travel plans, whether it's racing on track, one day it's dry, one day it's wet, climates are changing, conditions are changing, time zones are changing. You can't have a strict routine in the sport that we do. And you've got to you've got to be dynamic. You've got to accept that things will change. What's the hidden cost of the life that you live? The hidden cost is um, there's a lot of sacrifice on not only you, but probably the people around you. Um, The emotions you go through. Once again, it's not just you. It's everyone is on this journey with you. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, probably the biggest hidden cost is is that emotion. You, I see the effect it has on the people I'm closest to when I yeah. succeed. Yeah. And that's such a great sort of elation and feeling to see that you've had this positive impact on the people you love the most. But when something goes against you or you have a bad weekend or you fail, I see this on the people around me as well. Yeah. So you're carry, you know, probably carrying that weight. And just to take on from that, the conversation about mental health is a, is an important one for men to have. How much does what you do challenge your mental health? Uh, it absolutely challenges your mental health so much, and you've got to be so resilient to the negativity in this world, whether it's the public perception, whether it's social media whether it's the the pressures of the team or even the pressures of yourself. But I think the biggest one probably for me is um, that public perception and social media side, which is a tough one. And I think that's also relatable to people who aren't in the spotlight because social media is a pretty ruthless Mm. um, 
platform. And what have you learned to deal with at it? At the moment. The the thing I've learned, well, one with social media is just don't read comments. <laughs> That's a, a pretty straightforward, simple one. Yeah. But talking to a professional, I think I I have a psych- psychologist who I talk to. Um, it's not routinely, but I always pick up the phone whenever I feel like I need it. And I always leave that conversation feeling better about myself. There's sort of a weight lifted nice. off my shoulders. And I think, you know, a number of people have said this before. It's the same way as if you want to get fitter, you go to the gym and you speak to a personal trainer. If there's anything weighing on your mind, yeah. you need to talk to a, prof- a professional about it and um, seek that help. But also, you know, you go to the gym when your body's not broken. Yeah. And I think people will often only go and seek professional help when the mind is broken. I think yeah. there's a power there that you don't go and see someone when you're at your lowest ebb. Absolutely. You know, they're there all the time for you if you if you need it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I've been very lucky to have the right people around me to almost push me to do this. You know, even though you are I'm in a good place right now, let's just keep it going. Let's keep yeah, the conversations yeah. on going. And often I've been in a good place, but as soon as that conversation starts, you know, it sort of uh, all flows out. So right. yeah, I think that's a really good analogy. If you don't mind us being intrusive and you don't have to answer this, what would you say has been the biggest lesson you've learned from those conversations with the psychologist? The conversation with the psychologist, it's for me, it's difficult to put into words because they are truly um, experts within their field. And I always, you know, come away from from a conversation with with my psychologist and whether I talk to my girlfriend or my family and they just like, oh, how was that? I try and explain some of the things that we spoke about and the piece of advice that he gave me, but I actually struggle to say it, but it's because that's what they're so good at. And I said, I, I can't, I literally say, I can't really describe what it was that he said or how he said it, but I feel better for it. And I would really recommend anybody who's got the opportunity to, to talk to a professional, even if you've never done it before, just go out there and just give it a try and, and see what you think. And I think you'd be really surprised at, at what you can take from it. Brilliant. The power of talking. The power which of is talking. what we've done for the last little while. And a really fascinating conversation where we haven't Thank really you. spoken that much about the mechanics of Formula One. But, it, you know, about it. it's been great just hearing that people from the outside see a very linear journey from go-karting to Formula One driving. And the fact that it isn't that, which you've explained so well, but you've explained the lessons you've taken from all of those difficult moments, which appreciate it. Has you where you are. Thank you very much. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Thank you. Brilliant. Honestly, Thank mate, you. fantastic. It's so appreciate interesting. Thank you. Just a quick one to say thank you so much for watching this content on the High Performance channel. We would love it if you would subscribe. You know, most people that watch what we do don't subscribe. If you can subscribe, we can make this bigger, better, bolder than we've ever done before. So hit subscribe right now and help the High Performance podcast make a real difference to the world. See you soon.